The scripture text for this morning of sermon will be 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 9. Hear now the reading of God's inspired, inerrant, and infallible word. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Please be seated. Let us pray and ask the Lord to bless the proclamation of His Word. Heavenly Father, we thank You for the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of God's Son crucified and raised. We pray that by the power of Your Spirit working through Your gospel, You would seal Christ and His benefits to us, and You would build us up as You are giving us our inheritance among those who are being sanctified. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning about the benefit of Jesus' death and resurrection for you, the church. But I am mindful of something. I was talking to Carlton on the way back from the airport. I'm aware that there's a very rich tradition of expository preaching that you hear regularly, and my only note of sadness this morning is that this is a bit more of a topical sermon. And topical sermons can very easily become a hobby horse for the pastor leading astray from the text. But the happy note is that this sermon is on the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and its value for you. And so every text that we treat is constrained by that glorious Christ-centered theme. So with that in mind, I want to begin and remind you of something very basic about who you are. Before you are a father or a mother, a grandparent, a child, or anything else, you are first and foremost a Christian. Before you're a pastor or an elder or a deacon or work as an employee, you are before that a Christian. Jesus Christ has become for you wisdom from God, your righteousness, holiness, and redemption. He has loved you and given himself for you so that the life that you now live in the flesh, you live by faith in the Son of God. You are not your own. You have been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. You belong to him in this age and in the age to come. What I want to talk to you about then in this short time this morning is what it means for you to be joined to a crucified and resurrected Savior. What does it mean concretely for you as the church of Jesus Christ? How does that union impact your service of the Lord, your interaction with one another? What does it mean to be joined to Jesus Christ crucified and raised? Well, the answer I want to sketch is summarized in brief form in the Westminster Larger Catechism, question and answer 75, regarding the doctrine of sanctification. And in that question and answer, here is what is said about the Christian life, about your Christian life. The Spirit, working through the Word of God, quote, applies the death and the resurrection of Christ to you, the church, to those of you united to Jesus by the Spirit and through Spirit-gifted faith. 
And what is so striking about that language is that it takes for granted that the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is applicable to those other than Jesus. You see, it's not only the case that Jesus Christ was crucified in his body on the cross and died and remained under the power of death for three days, and then supernaturally by the Spirit sent from the Father and the Son was raised to new life in his body. That's supernatural and mysterious enough. But in addition to that, our catechism says that the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ are applied to you, the church, in your union with him. Now I want to tell you that is a staggering statement and it is so easy to gloss over it and simply say, yes, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ are applied to me and move on. But let me suggest that we need to take time this morning and explore precisely what it means first for Christ that he was crucified and raised and what it means for you in your union with Christ that his death and resurrection are applied to you. What is the benefit of Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection for you? Well, let me put it in its broadest scope when we talk about Jesus. The death of Jesus Christ is his comprehensive disenfranchisement from this fallen world. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the beginning of his enfranchisement into the world to come, into heaven itself. When Jesus died on the cross, he died to this fallen world that we inhabit. When Jesus was raised from the dead three days later, and when Jesus bodily ascended into heaven 40 days after that, Jesus Christ became permanently identified with heaven as his permanent dwelling place. Paul can call him in 1 Corinthians 15, 47, the man of heaven, the man who has been raised to inhabit heaven. Now, it's just with this in view that we must understand Jesus' ministry on earth and what he said to those he encountered during his earthly ministry. For instance... When Pilate called Jesus before him, he asked Jesus this question. He said, your nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from this world. Jesus' point is that he did not come to establish an earthly kingdom through militaristic force. If that were the case, his disciples would be fighting for him, but his kingdom is not of this world. It is not a kingdom that is of this fallen age. And that tells you something significant about the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross of Jesus Christ points beyond this visible world to a presently veiled, glorious realm that the Apostle Paul calls the invisible heaven or the things above where Christ is. So when Jesus, for instance, in Luke 9, 28, speaks to Moses and Elijah, when he meets with them on the Mount of Transfiguration where he takes Peter, John, and James to pray, as he was praying, verse 29, the appearance of his face was altered, his clothing became dazzling white, and behold, two men spoke with him. Moses and Elijah. And what was the content of their conversation with Jesus? They appeared in glory with him and spoke of his departure. 
if you know the Greek, and you'll be able to hear this even if you don't know the Greek, they spoke to him of his exodon, his exodus, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. That exodus, that work of Jesus on the cross would be the inauguration of an exodus out of Jerusalem and in to heaven. The exodus Jesus would accomplish at Jerusalem is a crucifixion on earth that would have its fruition in bodily resurrection and bodily translation into heaven itself. In fact, when Jesus is raised and when Jesus speaks to his disciples on the day of Pentecost in Acts 1, 9 through 11, after he has taught them all things in the scriptures concerning himself, what did his disciples do? Do you remember what they did on the day of Pentecost? They stood, as it were, like this. And they watched as Jesus, in his body, ascended up from their sight and passed through the clouds and entered into the glory dimension of heaven itself. Now, you don't reflect on that as often as you should. I know I don't. But that is a bona fide supernatural work of the Spirit whereby Jesus in his body is translated into heaven to sit at the right hand of God and make intercession for his church. It is stupendous and supernatural at its core. And in that event, you see the exodus out of Jerusalem being accomplished. It is a movement from the earthly hill of Golgotha to the heavenly mountain of God in Zion. And the first sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, 23 and following, the first sermon on the day of Pentecost interprets that event. The deed, Jesus ascends up into heaven. The word, the sermon, an interpretation of that ascension. Listen, Peter says, this Jesus, whom you just saw ascend, was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified him and killed him by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says, and now the, he's quoting from uh, Psalm 16, 9 through 10. Listen. For David says concerning him, the crucified and ascended Christ, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Please hear this. The Old Testament text of Psalm 16, 9 through 10, according to Peter, was about the crucifixion and especially the bodily ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven where he sees and knows the path of life and as ascended into heaven is filled with the gladness of the presence of God. And in that, the exodus out of Jerusalem is brought to its climax. The end of the exodus out of Jerusalem for Jesus is his bodily translation into the heavenly paradise, the kingdom that is not of this world, the presence of the Father in the power of the Spirit in heaven. Jesus' death is his disenfranchisement from this world. Jesus' resurrection and ascension is his permanent enfranchisement in the world to come. That is the foundation of the gospel that you confess. It is our hope. But what does that mean for you, the church? What benefit is his death and resurrection, his cross and his ascension for you, the church? Jesus taught us what the significance is. In John 14, 2 through 3, he said, after he was raised from the dead and ascended into heaven, he said this, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. 
In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. Do you hear that? Jesus' bodily ascension into heaven, his entrance into his Father's house, is where he goes to prepare a place for you, his people, you, his church. The text makes it quite clear that Jesus' entrance into the dwelling place of the Father's house in the power of the Spirit, that place filled with everlasting joy and life, is that he might prepare it as a dwelling place for you as you are brought to him. He sums it up by saying, I will come again. I will take you to be with me. Where I am, you always will dwell. You see, the Father's house is the place of paradise because it is the place where Jesus dwells. And it is the place where he has promised to bring you. He has passed once and for all beyond the earthly hill of Golgotha. He has entered into his father's house. And he now ever lives there. Preparing it as a place where he will bring you his church. In fact, when Jesus speaks to the thief on the cross in Luke 23, 43. When the thief says, remember me when you come into your kingdom, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, today, literally in the Greek, you with me in paradise. Paradise is a different way to describe the Father's house. Paradise is the goal of the exodus out of Egypt. But this is not only for Jesus but also for those who are in Jesus, united to Jesus, bound to Jesus by the Spirit's work through Spirit-gifted faith so that there is a bond, an unbreachable bond of union and communion with this crucified and resurrected Savior. But let me make explicit, more explicit, what these texts are saying whether it's John 14, Luke 23, or other texts. Jesus' exodus in his death and resurrection is an exodus that includes you, the church, within it. Jesus does not enter the Father's house to leave you where you are. He does not enter into paradise to leave you where you are. He enters into his Father's house. He enters into paradise so that you might be brought to him to behold his glory and be satisfied with his presence forever. You in your union with Christ then, by his death, are being delivered out of this world, and by his resurrection, you are being delivered into heaven. I want to make that explicit. I want to give you some biblical text that will etch that in your mind. Let me say it one more time for emphasis. You, as the death of Jesus is applied to you, are being delivered out of this world. You, by virtue of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, are being delivered and translated into heaven right now. It is an exodus underway. First text that makes this explicit, Galatians 1.4. Listen. Paul says that Jesus gave himself up for our sins, listen closely, to deliver us from this present evil age. Now, Jesus' death is a wrath-satisfying, sin-removing, church-reconciling, redemptive-securing reality. It is all that. But it is, at its core, a work that delivers the church out of this present evil age, that breaches the dominion of sin and the power of death and begins the process of delivering the church out of this fallen eon, out of this fallen age. When you, by the Spirit, through faith, are united to Christ, when you embrace Him, 
as he is revealed in Scripture, the efficacy of his death is that he breaches the power of sin and begins delivering you out of this world. Just as the blood that was shed by the Paschal Lamb under the exodus out of Egypt, delivered out of Egypt and into the promised land, so likewise the blood of this lamb delivers you out of this present evil age and emancipates, frees, liberates you. And related to this, that cross not only delivers you from this present evil age, it begins to conform you to the suffering and death of Jesus Christ. Paul says in Philippians 3.10 that you now know the fellowship of his suffering and are being conformed to his death. The cross not only delivers, but it stamps you with an introduction into the fellowship of suffering and conformity to death. Paul says in Romans 8.18 that this is an age of suffering but in your union with Christ, you are being delivered out of the suffering as Christ groans for you and delivers you by his spirit. The cross, if you have any home in this world at all as a pilgrim and stranger, is at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. It is your hope and your deliverance. But hidden away, in the inner chamber of your fellowship of Christ's sufferings, you know, in addition, the joy, the comfort, the life, and the freedom that belongs to you in Jesus Christ, even as you have been raised to seek those things above. Listen to what 1 Peter 1, 4 through 5 says. If Galatians 1, 4 says that the cross applied to you delivers you out of this present evil age, the resurrection, please hear this, right now, the resurrection power of Jesus Christ delivers you into heaven. And listen, 1 Peter 1, 4 through 5. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Now listen, Peter could not be clearer. Neither could Paul. Paul tells you that by his death you are delivered out of this present evil age. Peter tells you that by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, when you are born again, listen, it's not just that you have new life, but it's that that new life inaugurates an entrance into heaven now, here and now. You are literally begotten again into a living hope into a kingdom that cannot perish, spoil, or fade, into a kingdom kept in heaven for you. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was his translation into heaven, and through that resurrection you have been given new birth and are now enfranchised in heaven. Do you hear the language? It is, you are being kept for heaven even as heaven is being kept for you. And you have now seen and entered by faith into heaven where Christ is. And Peter says this about that entrance. That you rejoice even though now for a little while if necessary you have been grieved by various trials. But even in that grief, though you do not yet see Jesus, you believe in him and you rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Now I want to ask you a very practical question. Why is it that Christians can rejoice in their suffering? What explains the fact that you can find true joy as you are being disenfranchised in this age, when people speak evil against you, when you undergo persecution and trial and tribulation and hardship? What is it that gives you joy that is full of glory and inexpressible in 
those trials, I'm going to tell you and try to boil it down as basically as I know how, there's one and only one thing that enables that. The personal presence of Jesus in you. In Ephesians 3.16, the Apostle Paul says this, by way of prayer, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that, listen, Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. By the supernatural power of the Spirit, the crucified and ascended Christ dwells in your heart now, personally present to you by faith. And what does he do? He comforts you with the comfort he has received from his Father. He reminds you that his cross has borne away all of the wrath and curse against you. And he reminds you as well that in your fellowship of suffering, you have come to know the path of life. You have come to know the pleasure that dwells at the right hand of God. And as you know him in the fellowship of his sufferings, you know him in the glory of his resurrection and life. He confers upon you the life of heaven. The pleasures of life in the presence of God have come down to you from heaven in the personal presence of Christ so that Paul can say, you, Ephesians 2, 5, have been made alive, raised, and seated with Christ in heaven. He has raised you to himself and he dwells in your heart and by the Spirit gives himself to you as your blessedness and reward. Already now. Your faith feeds on this Christ. Your faith abides in this Christ. Your faith finds comfort and knows the joy of dwelling in Jesus who will never leave you and will never forsake you. And the beauty of this gospel is that the one you now know by faith, one day, hidden to all on this earth, will make himself known visibly. He will part the invisible heavens. He will show his church the glory of the heavenly realm into which he has been raised, the imperishable, unfading, incorruptible kingdom in heaven for you, into which you have now been raised, in which you now participate by faith. He will part the visible heavens, and your faith will become sight, and Christ will perfectly, personally, and permanently encourage you as he brings you into his Father's house and gives you everlasting comfort and all of the suffering, all of the death, all of the hardship, all of the tribulation will fade away once and for all as you behold the glory of God in the face of Christ in his Father's house in the paradise dwelling place where he is ascended, and it is there that he will wipe away every tear and bring permanent joy and delight to all of his people as that delight consists in the worship of his name and the full satisfaction, the infinite satisfaction that only his personal presence can bring. That is the ultimate benefit of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for you, his church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this gospel and pray that you would build us up in Christ, fill us with all of his fullness, and continue to comfort us with the grace that belongs to us in Jesus Christ. Continue to make known to us all of the manifold fullness that is in our Lord and Savior And bless us as we continue to worship you this morning in spirit and in truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.